recording has started. All right, welcome back to EC3030. Today we're going to take this opportunity to review the materials for the first midterm, which is scheduled on this Thursday. And uh, you will have 24 hours uh, for the take-home exam. And uh, here are the logistics we posted on the canvas. So here we are going to post the PDF of the questions on the Thursdays noon at 12 p.m. And we will not track when you download the PDF. But you supposed to have 24 hours if you start downloading right at 12 p.m. So then you will need to upload your solutions like your scanned uh, papers, like your homework, back to the canvas uh, before the Friday, 11.59 a.m., also the noon. The late submissions are subject to the penalty per syllabus. So we will apply the penalty percent, like 80% if you are one day late, and 50% uh, if you are two days late and we will not accept any submissions beyond two days late. And the meter one covers materials from lecture one to eight. And today we are going to review the key concepts and equations during the lecture. So the exam is open book and lecture notes. That means you can refer to the lecture slides or the textbook, but you should complete it on your own with the normal academic integrity. So that means you are not allowed to discuss with others on the exam questions. You should complete on your own. Okay. So online forum discussions are not allowed. Those activities are regarded as cheating. And uh, we are going to monitor those popular online forums like Czech or Hero or other forums that typically students share the like, homeworks. So we are going to monitor that. And uh, actually ECE, uh, the admin, purchased a Czech account. So we have the uh, access to those online forums and we can monitor any real-time discussions there. So we will take this seriously, and if we found any dishonesty from there, then we will report to the dean's office, and the student may be subject to the sections from the dean's office, and you may fail in this class. So I don't, don't hope to see this kind of situation in our class. And then the TL's office hour on this Thursday or Friday will be canceled because you are not supposed to ask TA for the help on the exam. So any questions here? All right, so then we are going to post the PDF of the exam questions under the exam folder here. So then later you can download from here. So within this folder, we already posted the tips, equations we are going to review today. And also last week, we have done this uh, sample exam as a practice. And then for the homework, uh, review session yesterday. The grader Dana has uh, conducted this virtual review session, and uh, I think he posted a link to the recorded version. So if you somehow missed the review session yesterday for the homework one and two, then you can look look at the recorded version here. So we are not going to post the solutions for the homework one and two online. But if you want to uh, review the solutions, please watch the video by the reader. 
And uh, any questions? All right, then let's uh, have our review of the first meter materials. So this is what we posted in the exam folder. And this is the tips for the first meter and how to succeed in the first meter. So the topics we are going to cover is from lecture one to lecture eight. And the lecture one is the introduction. And the lecture two is the resistors and interconnects. And then lecture three to lecture six, we cover the semiconductor physics, basically the silicon's properties. And first we describe the silicon's property using a bound model. And then later we look at the same physical picture from the band model point of view. So the band model is very important. And then the carrier statistics. Uh, carriers means electrons and holes in the silicon. And the statistics means like the probability to find the electrons at certain energy level following the Fermi function. And also the electron host density based on the Fermi statistics, which means how to calculate the N and P according to the doping density, Na or the Nd. And then later we talk about the carrier transport, means how fast the carriers move. And there are two mechanisms for the carriers to move in the silicon. One is drift, one is diffusion. Drift is under the electric field, and diffusion is caused by the difference in the concentration or difference in the density of the carriers in different regions of the silicon. And then lecture seven, we talk about the PN junction. And then we have the IV relationship, current versus voltage of the PN junction. And then we have the band diagram to describe the PN junctions forward bias versus the reverse bias. And the lecture eight is about the MOS cap. So this is a, an essential component of the MOSFET. Without the source and drain, we have the MOS cap, MOS, metal oxide semiconductor, and it's like a capacitor. And then we talk about the band diagram perpendicular to the channel, that is from the M to the S. You have the MOS structure. We talk about the band diagram along that direction. And then we derive the threshold condition for the MOS cap. So those are the topics we are going to cover in the first meter. And next, we are going to discuss some key abilities you are expected to have. So the first one is understand the copper and silicon crystal structure and how to calculate the atomic density. So if you recall the lecture two and three, we show the crystal structure for the copper and the silicon. Copper is metal. Silicon is a semiconductor, and uh, both of them have the unit cell that is the smallest repetitive unit in the crystal. And uh, we have the cube for that, and we have some uh, at atoms in the cube. So the first question is count how many atoms within one unit cell. Some of the atoms at the corner or at the center of the face actually are shared with other unit cells. So you need to count the contribution of those atoms to this specific unit cell. So you calculate the number of the cells, sorry, number of atoms in that unit cell, and then divide by the volume of that unit cell. Then you get the atomic density. So for copper, you have one shell electron per atom. So the shell electron density is the same as atomic density for copper. Uh, for silicon, you have four shell electrons per silicon atom. So you need to multiply by four for the silicon's shell electron density. 
So please note that the shell electron is different from the free electron. So the shell electron means those electrons are bonded with each uh, with, with, uh, with this uh, covalent bond. So then you need to break the bond to create the free and free electron and hole. So then this is the basic properties for the silicon and copper. Any questions here? All right, then number two, ability to calculate the resistivity of the interconnect metal materials such as aluminum and copper. So here, we typically use aluminum or copper for the interconnect and uh, calculate the resistivity. So resistivity rho uh, is one over the conductivity and conductivity is nq mu and uh, it depends on the electron density and also the mobility of the electron in the metal. So based on that, you will calculate the resistivity for the aluminum and copper, and then you know which one is lower, and you would prefer the lower resistivity for the interconnect. The number three, ability to perform the calculations based on the basic semiconductor equations, like the Fermi function, and relating the electron and hole densities and band model parameters and like the relative positions like EC, EV, EF, and EI so like the distance between the EC and EF so this is uh, related to the number four the ability to draw the band diagram of the intrinsic n-type or p-type semiconductor given the doping density so this is related and uh, you know, this is uh, the band diagram we care about in the silicon, where you have the band gap between the EC and EV, the conduction band and valence band. And uh, the EF depends on the doping, the Fermi level. So if it's in intrinsic, that means without doping, then the EF is in the middle of the band gap. But if you have n-type doping, then you know the EF is closer to the EC. This is for the n-type. And for n-type doping, you will have donor density nd. And given the donor density nd, you should be able to calculate the distance here, the relative position. And you know the n equals to nc exponential ef minus ec over kt so you can back calculate what is the ef minus ec so it's uh, kt natural log and uh, and let's say the nc sorry the n over nc And the electron density for the n-type doping, you know, is given by the donor's density nd. So you should be able to calculate this. And this one will be a negative number because the EF is lower than the EC. For example, you may get an negative 0.2 electron volts. And then you should be able to label this as 0.2 electron volts. And then you can get the other distance because the band gap is 1.1 .1 electron volt, then half of the, that is 0.55, then you should be able to get this distance as well, which is 0.35. Uh, so be able to calculate those numbers and uh, draw the band diagram accordingly. So this is uh, for the n-type doping, you can also do that for the p-type. Any questions? The energy difference equals Q times potential difference, right? Uh, you are right. So here in this band diagram, we are talking about the energy band. So here the unit we have is the electron volts. That is for the energy. 
uh, if you talk about the potential difference, then that is uh, get rid of the E, that means you have snack energy divided by Q, the charge, and then you get the voltage difference that is in the volt, that is uh, like potential, voltage potential difference. So here is proportional, the, the potential and the energy here, they are differed by this Q, or in the unit, it's differed by the electron, EV. You get rid of the E, then you get the voltage. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let's go back to here. And uh, then number five, understand the mechanism of drift and diffusion current in semiconductor and the Einstein relationship. So drift is the motion of the carrier under the field. And then the velocity of the drift proportional to the electric field. And the coefficient is called mobility. The mobility basically tells you how fast the carrier moves under certain electric field. And then diffusion is caused by the difference in the concentration or in the do or in the density of the carriers in different regions of the silicon. And then it's proportional to the gradient of that concentration. So those two are related through the Einstein relationship. So basically the mobility mu is proportional to the uh, diffusion constant D. And uh, you have derived that uh, in your homework too. And then number six, ability to qualitatively explain the unidirectional behavior of the current flow in the PN junction based on the band diagram and electron and hole densities. So this is for the PN junction. And uh, for the PN junction, then you should be able to understand this band diagram. So you have P and N. In the equilibrium state, that means without vo external voltage, the system will have a single Fermi level. So EF is flat here. And uh, then for the PN junction, it's always, let's say, ground the N side, and then you apply the voltage to the P side. So at the equilibrium state, without voltage, then you know the N side here you have electrons in the conduction band and those electrons follow the Fermi function or let's say the Boltzmann approximation is like the exponential function in the distribution of the electrons. So those electrons will have some probability to jump over the barrier, move to the P side and this is caused by the diffusion. On the other hand, the slope in the band diagram means the electric field. And the electron, like water, always go to lower potential. So this is caused by the drift. So in the equilibrium state, the diffusion and drift should cancel each other. So the net current is zero. And however, in the forward bias, if you apply positive voltage to the P side, as we discussed, positive voltage always push down the band. So the band is lowered. Then the barrier height, so here you have this built-in barrier height barrier height will reduce. Then you have more electrons diffuse over. Then the electron flow will be from the right to the left, from the N to the P. Or in other words, the current from the P to N. So this is a forward current. And this is an exponential dependency of the current on the barrier height which is modulated by your voltage. So that's why that's why IV is exponential to the forward. And similarly, you can discuss the reverse bias. 
where when you apply negative voltage to the P side, so the barrier height is increased, then the diffusion will not happen, then the drift will dominate. So you have the drift current. But the drift current is small because you have limited number of electrons here. So then the drift current will saturate in the negative side. So this is how you explain the IV relationship from the PN junction. Any questions? All right, and then number seven, the MOS structure, MOS, metal oxide semiconductor. And understand the threshold definition. So at the threshold, um, we have two definitions here. First one is the density of the minority carrier at the surface, for example, the electron, become equal to the density of the majority carrier at the bulk, for example, hole. This is a strong immersion. And also at this uh, condition, the gate voltage equals to the threshold voltage, and then the surface potential, that is the band bending at the surface, becomes 2 phi B. So what does this mean? So you need to understand the MOS band diagram, MOS. And uh, in the equilibrium state without the voltage, let's say MOS. So you have a single Fermi level. And then you apply, this is the method, this is P type substrate, so this is N type MOS. Okay. And then when you apply positive voltage to the gate, that is push down the Fermi level of the metal. This is your gate voltage. And then the band will bend. Like this. So the surface will become N type. Here, this is the surface. While this bulk is a P type substrate. So here at the threshold, we have two, let's say, a conditions will be valid. First one is a phi S. What is phi S? Phi S is this one. That is a bending of the band at the surface. So phi S equals to 2 phi B. This is, this is at threshold. So what is phi B? If you draw the EI, that is intrinsic Fermi level. So the difference between EI and EF is phi B. At the threshold, the surface potential becomes 2 phi B. Why 2 phi B? Because you need to invert the channel here. You need to change it from P-type to N-type. So initially for the P-type as a bulk, so that keep P-type. Your EF is below EI by phi B. This is as a bulk. But as a surface here, then you are inverted. And now the EF is above the EI by phi B. So you change it from below by phi b to above by phi b. So in total you change by 2 phi b. So that's why the surface potential becomes 2 phi b. And also at this moment, then because the distance will be the same at the surface versus the bulk, if you look at the EF towards the EC at the surface, that is the EC minus EF, will be the same as the EF minus 
EV as a puck. So the distance will be the same. That translates to be the electron density at the surface equals to the hole density at the puck. So that is a strong inversion. The surface change from the p-type to the n-type, and this n-type is as strong as the p-type in the substrate at the puck. So this is the definition of the threshold. At this moment, your gate voltage actually is larger than this phi s because the gate voltage has two components. One is VOX, one is phi s. So you apply the voltage to the gate, and this voltage drop across first the oxide, and second the surface of the silicon. So that's why the voltage, gate voltage equals to VOX plus phi s. And then if you plug in the threshold condition like phi s equals to phi b, then you can derive the threshold voltage equation, which we will review that in the equation sheet later. And then you can derive the threshold voltage. All right, any questions here? Oops. This is gone. Uh, one question from the chat. Why isn't the Fermi level bent during inversion? Okay, that's a good question. So, the Fermi level uh, is a constant if there's no current flow. So, that's also the definition of the um, equilibrium state. So, in the most type structure here, because it's a capacitor, so from the MOS direction, there's no current flow. Okay. Even though you apply the voltage here and bend down the band, in the silicon, there's no current flow. So there's no current flow means it's in this equilibrium state, so the EF should be flat. Okay. EF is an indicator of the Fermi level. Sorry, it's an indicator of the equilibrium state. So if you don't have current flow, then the EF will be will be the same. So because there's no current flows through the oxide, this is insulator. So this is different from the PN junction. If you recall the PN junction, then the EF does split in that case. Why is that? So if you think about the PN junction. So this is the PN junction at the equilibrium state. So zero voltage here. Zero voltage, then flat EF. But if the voltage is larger than zero, then we push down the band here. So since there's current flow, so this EF really splits. So it will be something like this. EF N side, or EF P side, and EF N side. So we do split the EF. Because in this case, we have the voltage larger than zero, and they have current flow. Okay. And the ability to calculate the threshold voltage maximum depletion weights and their dependency on the parameters like the doping density and the oxide thickness. So those are the equations for the threshold voltage and depletion weights. We will review that uh, later in the uh, equation sheet. And then number nine, draw and analyze the band diagram. Okay, when the gate voltage increases from zero and 
to above the threshold. So this is what we already discussed here. So the band diagram of the MOS, as we change the gate voltage, then how would this band bend according to the gate voltage? Okay, so those are the key abilities uh, you are expected to have for the meter one. And here are some practical tips. And first one, nothing is beyond the lecture materials. So you should expect all the questions within the scope of our lectures, uh, nothing beyond. And then practice the sample exams. And we have done that last week. And uh, redo the homeworks, if you wish and review the lecture examples. So we have some examples in the lecture as well. Review that. And you do need a real calculator. And uh, you can use your computer and uh, do that. That's fine. Uh, in this uh, virtual exam settings. Uh, but in, if it's a classroom setting, then we will have uh, like a one page cheat sheet allowed in, in the classroom setting. But in this semester, since we do the take home exam, then we don't need this cheat sheet. You can refer to your lecture notes or the textbook if you wish. And we do provide this equation and the constant parameters, and we will review that in the next minute. And that will be attached to the exam papers as well. Okay, number four is what I want to emphasize today. Pay attention to the true or false question. Okay, the first uh, question is the true or false, similar as the sample exam we have done last week. But here we have a grading policy on the true or false question. That is, if your answer is incorrect, then there will be a penalty. That means negative points tied to that question. So what does this mean? Okay, so we will have 10 true or false questions, and each question is worth two points. So in total, you will have 20 points available. And of course, if you have 10 questions correct, then you got the full credit, 20. But if you have, let's like, say, nine correct and one wrong, then we apply negative one point to the wrong questions. That means you will get 9 times 2 minus 1. So we get 17 points. This minus 1 is a penalty for that incorrect question. Or if you get like uh, 8 correct, 2 wrong, then we will, you will have 8 times 2 minus 2. Those minus 2 are for those 2 incorrect questions. So you will get 14 in total. So the way we design this is to discourage the random guess. Because if you randomly guess, you may have 50% of the probability to get it correct. So to discourage the random guess, we apply this negative points. So the best strategy for you is to leave it blank if you are uncertain about it. So don't, just, don't try the random guess. So if you are uncertain, then you leave it blank. Of course, you get zero, but it's better than negative point for that question. So total, you have 20 points available, and uh, we are not going to uh, have the negative points for the total. Let's say the 10 questions, the minimal score for those 10 questions, zero. Okay, if you, let's say, get 10 wrong, then according to that policy, you get negative 10 points, but then uh, we will cut off that to be zero for total of these 10 questions. Okay, so any question about this? Okay, so pay attention to those true or false questions. Those are like conceptual questions as we did in the sample exam. And then for the true or false questions, we don't require any just justification uh, or clarification uh, on why you choose true or why you choose false. Okay, we're not going to give partial credit 
for the true or false. We only look at your final choice, true or false. And there's an, uh, another tip for this true or false, and that is if the statement is uh, partially correct and partially wrong, then it's wrong. Okay. Only when the statement is uh, completely correct, then it's true. Then for the other questions, let's say after the true or false question, we may have, uh, let's say, I think, uh, four, four or five other questions. And each question may have sub-questions as well. And for those questions, mostly are like uh, calculations. And uh, you can get partial credit by writing down the appropriate equations first. So basically, state your assumptions first and try to write down your approach and uh, equations first. And then you plug in the numbers and do the numerical calculations and get the final value. So we will look at the uh, solutions on, based on two steps. The first one is your approach or the question. So if that is correct, then we'll give you the partial credit. And then later we look at your final or numerical value. So do those in two steps. If you're doing one step, you directly apply the numbers without showing your like, equations. Then if the numbers wrong, then we cannot uh, infer what you are trying to do there. Then we will not give you the partial credit. So always Try to write down your equations first. Of course, you need to write down the correct equation. If the equation you use is wrong, then you will get zero there. Okay, any questions? The key equations are already posted, and we are going to review that in in the next minute. And also, it's attached to the PDF files of the exam.